called cerebral cortex. This is the most outer layer, which is divided into lobes, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. Again, in the in a given lobe, you can see depression is called sulfide. One of them is called sulcus, and there are also projections called gyri. One of them is called gyrus. This is anatomical aspect of the cerebral cortex. Again, you can also divide the whole cerebral cortex of one hemisphere into functional parts. Usually, 49 functional areas. For now, the frontal lobe, the most anterior part of the cerebral cortex, of the cerebral hemispheres, is used to express our emotions, to express our personality, or by which we can manifest our personality. And it shows the extent of our morality, intellect, or it is by which we control muscles which help us to speak. So speech, speech, emotions, personality, morality, intellect, all of them are controlled by the most anterior part of the cerebral hemispheres. The parietal law is usually for sensory functions like pain, heat, touch. Hearing and smelling in the temporal lobe. Hearing and smelling in the occipital is for vision. So the cerebral cortex of a given hemisphere is the main part of the brain, and in fact, it is the most the largest part of the brain. To encase this large cerebrum into a small area of the skull, or to decrease its surface area, you have grooves and projections. And for our convenience, we also divide it into lobes. Then you have the cerebellum. This cerebellum is generally for balancing, equilibrium, walking, dancing, and the medulla oblongata is for breathing, chewing, test. It controls the heart, the lungs, the stomach, and blood vessels. The pulse for eye, eye reflexes, or they conduct impulse. So the whole brain is functionally divided. That means it has anatomical parts as well as functional areas. Functional areas could be, shall if you look at the cerebrum, it has 49 functional areas. For our convenience, generally the parietal lobe is sensory, the frontal lobe is motor and emotion, personality, morality, intellect, and speech. Temporal lobe, hearing and smelling. Occipital lobe, vision. Cerebellum, usually muscle tone. Means equilibrium, walking, dancing, medulla oblongata, breathing, and so on and so forth. So these are general, and I don't expect when, I don't expect you to remember each and everything. But you have to know at least some general parts. So the whole brain is protected by bones like the skull. The skull in case of the brain, the vertebral column in case of the spinal cord. And there's also tissues, special tissues, or the meninges, the hardest, the toughest one, Duramata. Next to that, arachnoid, 
and the deepest thinner part air matter. These are special tissues which protect the brain as well as the spinal cord. Dura matter, arachnoid, yeah. The exterior one, dura, tough. The most interior one, yeah, thinner. Between them, there is arachnoid matter. In addition to this, there is a fluid. The fluid rotates or flows in the ventricles, like lateral ventricle, third ventricle, or the ventricle, and central canal of the spinal cord. So that fluid is called cerebrospinal fluid in the cerebrum and the spinal cord. So this fluid by itself has many functions. One of them is a protective function. In addition to this, there are special areas called blood-brain barrier. The blood flowing between the brain and vessels. There is a blood supply to the brain and the spinal cord. But there is no direct communication between the, the brain and the spinal cord, as well as the blood. What does it mean? It means there is a barrier. So that is protected. Blood, brain. This barrier is supported by supporting cells of the neurons. As we have seen earlier, neurons are the main functional units of the nervous system. Supporting these neurons, there are many types of cells. We call them glial cells. These glial cells for blood brain barrier directly protecting the brain as well as the spinal cord from infections. Generally, as we have seen earlier, the bones protect the brain. The moment you remove these bones, you don't see the brain, rather, you will see protective structures like dura mater, ea mater, and arachnoid. In case of the spinal cord, the bones, vertebral column, that means the vertebrae. Next to the vertebrae, there is also dura mater, arachnoid, ea mater. We we'll look at it more elaborately. In the case of the brain, you can see eggs, skin, there is a covering a given, like any other bone, aerosteum, then you have bone of the skull. When you remove the bone, the first structure you see is dura mater, toughest, dura means tough, so the first structure, the first structure, dura mater. This dura mater by itself has two layers, periosteal layer, outer one, meningeal layer, inner one. So periosteal, meningeal. Again, when you go deep, there is arachnoid matter. This thinner part, relatively compared to the dura, arachnoid. Then, adherent to the substance of the brain, adherent to the substance of the brain, there is pia matter. matter. To go back again, bones, dura outer layer, dura inner layer. Next to inner layer of dura, there is subdural space, the potential space. Very tight, but it is a potential space. Next to the subdural space, there is arachnoid matter. Next to the arachnoid matter, there is subarachnoid space. This one is the, the most potential space, which contains CSF and blood 
vessels. Cerebrospinal fluid flows in this special area, subarachnoid space. You can see next to this subarachnoid space, yeah, matter. Don't forget the order of structures. Skin, heliostem, bone of the skull, then outer layer, annular layer subdura, subdural space, then arachnoid matter, subarachnoid space. This space contains CSF and blood vessels supplying the brain, then adherent to the substance of the brain, then spear, very thin. This spear matter also penetrates the grooves of the cerebral. You can see gray matter, white matter. The gray matter has projections, guiding, depressions, salsa. You can see the cells are also covered by air matter. You can this is where you have blood brain barrier, which which prevents the direct communication between the blood and the substance of the brain itself. Blood brain barrier. Likewise, in the spinal cord, in the spinal cord, you have the same dura matter, arachnoid matter, pia matter. There is also subarachnoid space. There is also self. The difference is that dura matter is made up of just one layer. Made up of one layer, not two layers. See, in the spinal cord is this one. It starts as an extension of the spinal, the medulla oblongata, and it is contained in the vertebral canal but it doesn't extend throughout the vertebral canal. That means it's located or housed only in the two third parts of the vertebral canal. That means co compared to the whole vertebral canal, the spinal cord is shorter, even in the adult. Even in the adult, it's shorter. So this is the beginning of the spinal cord as extension of the medulla oblongata. Then this is the most inferior part of the spinal cord. We call it conus medullaris because it looks like a cone. The end part looks like a cone, conus medullaris. You can see the spinal cord has also enlargements in the neck, cervical enlargement. And in the lumbar, lumbar, lumbar enlargement. What I am trying to tell you is that, like the cell, the brain, the spinal cord is also protected by bones of the vertebral column. Next to the bones, next to the bones, there is, there is dura mater. Arachnoid matter and pia matter. Dura matter, arachnoid matter, even subarachnoid space, and pia matter covering the brain. We will see the spinal cord in detail later on. For now, what we are looking at is protective layers or structures of the central nervous system. These are bones, meninges, fluid, CSF, and barriers, blood brain barrier. So let's look at the spinal cord in cross section. If you look at the spinal cord in cross section, as opposed to the brain, the central part is gray matter. In the outer part or the peripheral one is white matter. In the cerebrum or the brain, outer part is gray matter, 
the same dry part in white matter. But exceptionally, in the deep inside the white matter, there are nuclei, independent nuclei. But because of that, we don't say the central part is gray and the outer part is white. Rather, say in the brain, the gray matter is peripheral, the white matter is central. But in the spinal cord, the gray matter is central, the white matter is peripheral. When you look at the gray matter, that's it. The gray matter, you can see, it looks, it has eight shape arrangement, eight shape arrangement. That means extending laterally when you go from the central canal, there are horns, dorsal horn, ventral horn, dorsal horn. Ventral wall. Sometimes in the thoracic region you may see lateral horn. For now, what we call gray matter is made up of this. White matter is made up of nerve fibers. In that in this case, axons. But these axons would be going to the brain upward going to the other parts of the spinal cord. That means they connect different parts of the spinal cord or they connect spinal cord to the brain. That means the lateral parts of the white matter contains tracts. tracts. These tracts will be going upward going superiorly, that means ascending tracts, going inferiorly from the brain toward the spinal cord, descending tracts. So this white matter is full of tracts. When you say tract, it contains fibers. When you say fibers, really accents. Then these accents could be divided to ascending and descending tracts. But this gray matter, like in the cerebrum, contains cell bodies. Cell bodies. Cell bodies. So this ventral horn on both sides usually contains cell bodies of motor neurons. Motor and not sensory. Motor neurons usually have a shape like multipolar neurons, right? So this gray matter is full of cell bodies of motor neurons. You may expect this those bones contain sensory neuron cell bodies. No. Rather it contains contains cell bodies of association neurons. Association. Okay? association neurons. So the gray matter of the spinal cord, spinal cord, the ventral horns, both sides, contain cell bodies of motor neurons. The dorsal horns contain cell bodies of association neurons. If there is a lateral horn, especially in the thoracic area, it may contain cell bodies of we shall see that later. But now what I'm trying to tell you is that sensory neurons are dead cell bodies outside, outside the sameness. Outside the sameness, okay? This is called spinal ganglion. It contains cell bodies of sensory neurons. Okay, this is a spinal nerve. And this ganglion, you can see it is a ganglion. 
ganglion is collection of cell bodies outside the central nervous system. In this case, this ganglion contains cell bodies of neurons, not motor. So you can intelligence motor, association neuron, and sensory neurons. So you have communication between motor neurons and association neurons. In association and sensory neurons, dorsal. So the spinal cord, its purpose is to receive impulse, either sensory or motor, from the exterior or the periphery part of the body toward the sinus. So the spinal cord, the whole extent of the cord by itself is not uniform. Yes? It's not uniform. It's not uniform. That not all regions of cross section of the spinal cord have the same features. First of all, when you go downward, yes, the spinal cord, its size decreases. This is in the neck region, cervical region, white, thoracic region legs, lumbar region, sacral region, like this. When you go down, the size of the spinal cord decreases. Likewise, when you section it, in the cerebral and the cervical region, you can see central canal, dorsal horn, ventral horn. Okay, go down like this, especially at the level of T8, you may see lateral horn. Okay, exceptional exception to the rule where you can see where you can see lateral horn in other regions, in other regions, you will see only ventral horn and dorsal horn. With the exception to the rule, at the level of thoracic vertebra, T8, you may see lateral horn of matter, which is composed of part of the autonomic nervous system, okay? part of the autonomic nervous system. So don't forget this, when you go downward, the spinal cord in decreases in size. That's one. It stops at the level of L1 and L2 in the adult. That's another. It has protective structure and it has also enlargements. Cervical enlargement and lumbar enlargement. What does it mean? You don't have thoracic enlargement and sacral enlargement. If you go back, you can see this is cervical enlargement, lumbar enlargement. You don't see thoracic enlargement. When you go down again, the size means diameter decreases. At the end, looks like a cone. That's why we call it conus medullaris. Conus medullaris. And you have also a lumbar enlargement. I will tell you the purpose of those enlargements later on. So,
this is not a complicated structure. This is just to show you, if you look at one segment of the spinal cord, dorsal horns contain sensory neurons, ventral horns contain our neurons. In this case, this is association neuron, and this is a sensory neuron. Sensory neurons have their cell body outside the sinus, outside, not inside. Because they are, these cell bodies are located outside the sinus, they form a collection known as ganglion. Ganglia is plural, ganglion is singular. As I told you earlier, these cell neurons are unipolar. That means their cell bodies do not form synapses. They, they don't communicate with other neurons. Rather, both the dendrites and the axon originate from the cell body via a common stem. That's why they look like a I mean, they, are, they look like unipolar neuron, but they are not unipolar. Rather, they are bipolar. One, another. You can take this one as an axon, this one as dendrite, but then both of them connect to the cell body via a common stem. That's why they appear as if they are unipolar when they are not. That's why sensory neurons are pseudo, pseudo unipolar neurons. Usually they are located at the back of the spinal cord, join the dorsal horn via association neurons, but then Ventral horns contain motor neurons. As I told you, motor neurons are multipolar. Cell bodies and dendrites are located here, but their action goes to the periphery of the body and forms a spinal cord, a spinal nerve, I mean. So this is a spinal nerve. A given spinal nerve is a mixed nerve, Mixed nerve because it contains sensory neurons entering the spinal cord and motor neurons leaving the spinal cord. Together, they form a spinal nerve. So these ventral roots and these are dorsal roots. Dorsal and ventral roots join together and form a spinal nerve. And how many spinal nerves do we have? We have 31 pairs. This is one right part of the segment, left part. So one pair, another pair, another pair, another pair, 31 pairs. Eight pairs of cervical, of thoracic, five pairs of lumbar, pairs of sacral and one pair of procedural spinal nerves. Again, one spinal nerve is a mixed nerve because it contains sensory neurons entering the spinal cord and motor neurons leaving the spinal cord. Not only this, a given spinal nerve also is part of the autonomic nervous system. So each segment, one segment, another segment, another segment, and the brain itself. So the brain and the spinal cord are connected by nerves. We call them tracts. These tracts would be going upward, in that case, ascending neurons, downward, downward, in that case, Descending neurons. 
Both of them are located in the white matter of the spinal cord. The white matter of the spinal cord and white matter of the cerebrum contains tracts. These tracts could be either descending down or ascending apart. Their purpose is to connect the cerebral cortex, which is the main part of the brain, means the controlling area, and the spinal cord. We are descending and ascending tracts. Don't worry about other parts of this image. Otherwise, there are first order neurons, second order neurons, and so on and so forth. So I want you to remember here, a given spinal nerve is an mixed nerve, one. Ventral roots contain motor neurons, dorsal roots contain sensory neurons. Additionally, ventral roots contain motor neurons and part of the autonomic nervous system. Not only this, White matter contains tracts. The tracts could be ascending or descending, that's all. If you look at a given segment, one segment of a given spinal cord, this is ventral hole, gray matter, central canal, dorsal hole, and this is white matter. Dorsal hole, dorsal root. You can take this one as dorsal root. It contains dorsal root ganglion, which is composed of same body of sensory neurons. Again, if you come back again to the center of the spinal cord, there is central canal, gray matter, ventral horn, and this is ventral root of the spinal Nerve, together they form a spinal nerve. Spinal nerve. So that's why the spinal nerve is a mixed nerve because it contains sensory and motor neurons. Sensory neurons are afferent neurons. What does it mean? They receive impulse from the interior and exterior parts of the body and direct that impulse to the same the central nervous system, afferent. Motor neurons conduct impulse from the same where this glands or muscles. Uh, or you can say motor neurons conduct impulse from the same to effector organs. Effector. Effector organs are generally glands and our muscles. So a given spinal nerve, that's why it's mixed. In this spinal nerve contains multipolar neurons and it's full of bipolar neurons, full of. But if you section this one, you will see only sensory neurons. If you section this one, motor neurons and part of the autonomic nervous system. Let's look at the other part of the same segment. It's just for motor neurons, you can see the cell body located at the, on the ventral cord. This is axon of that neuron. It joins to the spinal nerve. Impulse is coming from the periphery of the body. Go to the CNS. This one is a receptor, or it can be Dendrite. Cell body of the sensor neuron, common stem, then an axon. 
So connecting this and this between them, there must be an association neuron. Association neuron, we call them interneurons. We look at another diagram. Look at this side. This is the ventral canal, ventral horn, dorsal horn. Interneurons, cell body of motor neurons. You can see many of them join the spinal nerve. Again, dorsal horn, cell body of an interneuron, axon of axon of sensory neuron, cell body, common cell. This can be somatic sensory nerve index. We can take it as an an receptor. So this nerve is a mixed nerve, spinal nerve. This nerve is the union of these many ventral rootlets and dorsal rootlets. One of them root, if there are many rootlets. So they form a spinal nerve. The spinal nerve leaves the vertebral canal via the vertebral foramen. The moment it leaves that intervertebral foramen, again it divides into two. It bifurcates. The larger one, the thickest one, is called ventral ramus. The smaller one, the thinner one, is called dorsal ramus. You see, these rootlets, sensory, these are motor. They join and form a mixed nerve. This purpose, or the purpose of this one, is to equalize the number of motor neurons. So this ramus contains both motor and sensory neurons. This one also contains both motor and sensory. We don't call this one roots, rather we call them ramus. Ramus looks like a road. So ventral ramus supplying or mm, controlling the ventral part of the body, the dorsal ramus controls the smaller dorsal part of the body because this ventral ramus contains the upper limb, the trunk, and lower limb. That's why it is thicker and larger, since it contains many neurons. This dorsal ramus controls back muscles and the skin of the back. That's why it is thinner and contains fewer neurons. Round, it means the most anterior part of the body beyond the coronal plane is larger compared to the most posterior part. I will tell you again, the most anterior part beyond coronal plane is larger. What does it mean? It contains many three parts. That's why this is thicker and this one is thinner. This one is the same thing we have seen earlier. Motor neurons, sensory neurons. For example, the skin, receptors, impulse transmission, ganglion, and then from ganglion to the sinus. Connect this one together, not only that, this connect these two neurons to the lateral part of the spinal cord, that means tracts, they are association neurons. Association neurons. By the way, this region, if you look at it microscopically, it has many areas 
which has different specific parts. That means a given region contains certain types of neurons, either going upward or downward. These neurons are connected to the central part, gray matter, via association neurons. That's all. Again, look at this side. Ventral horn, cell bodies, motor neurons, axon, spinal nerve, ventral root, and this is dorsal root, dorsal ganglia. Spinal nerve, and this is a dorsal ramus, ventral ramus. The ventral one is thicker. Not only that, it's directly connected to the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic nervous system either enters or leaves the CNS via the ventral root. Ventral root. That's why this one is thicker. This one is gray ramus. And this one is white ramus. And this is called sympathetic ganglion. Okay? If you go back, the ganglion is collection of cell bodies. So far, how many ganglions we have seen? Dorsal root ganglion, made up of sensory neurons. And this is called sympathetic ganglion. It has an ascending part, descending part, one. Also, it has also neurons entering this and leaving this. Not only that, neurons ascending upward and descending up downward. So, this ganglia form a chain. Chain lateral to the thoracic vertebrae, we call it sympathetic chain. This chain is primarily made up of ganglia, which is in turn made up of cell bodies of the autonomic nervous system. Neurons entering this ganglia, leaving this ganglia. This the living ones may ascend upward, descend downward, or they may go to the interior of the body. Three options. Okay. Suppose a given neuron starts here, goes to the sympathetic in. Synapse, sorry, synapse. You have another neuron either ascending upward or descending downward, joining this white ramus, joining the spinal nerve, or directly going to a or a gland or an organ. So, if you go back, these neurons of the autonomic nervous system are preganglionic neurons. And these neurons going apart this way or this way, postganglionic neurons. If you go back again, this spinal nerve contains sensory neurons, neurons, as well as part of the autonomic nervous system. As an example, as an example, look, this is a lower limb. Sensory neuron receives sensory impulse from the lower limb. These receptors to cutaneous afferent neurons transmit, transmit impulse to the dorsal part of the body. Then you have interneurons. 
association neurons connecting the same neurons with cell body of a motor neuron. So, if it is a reflex, 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 that impulse must be conducted to a muscle via a motor neuron. Motor neuron. Yes. As both connected to the opposite side of the spinal cord. It's not complicated. It's like this. The right hand of the 